All right. I just have a checkbox I have to click on. Okay. All right. So, uh, Pan, I would like to start from the very beginning and ask you about your childhood. Were the movies a big part of your life growing up? And what was the very first movie that you remember watching? And what kind of emotions it elicited in you? Um, well, it's a great question. Um, my parents were making short films when I was this tiny child that went into the movie theaters. And I don't believe they could afford babysitters. So I think they took me with them when they were shooting movies. And one of my earliest memories was that my father and mother were making a movie about people that kept strange pets in England. And there was this lady who kept alligators and crocodiles in her home. And um, she uh, allowed me to ride her alligator in my father and mother's movie. Um, and I was four years old. And I originally thought that my mother couldn't possibly have been there that day. I mean, who's going to let their four-year-old ride an alligator uh, in this woman's <laughs> kitchen? Um, yeah. And um, the the most unusual thing was a an English uh, professor of herpetology, I think, found the movie a year and a half ago and sent it to me in 16 mil. So I was able to look at this film that was made in the early 50s and there I was riding the alligator in this in this movie, along with people with other strange pets. But there was also a teeny uh, piece of two or three seconds of my mother. So now I know she was there. <laughs> and uh, um, so that 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 experience of seeing my father uh, with cameras and uh, he was shooting them. Um, wherever you put a camera up, you get you gather a crowd of people. When you use a camera, you create something that you go into a dark room and you cast a spell onto a screen. And there's this image that you magically captured. And I knew from that age that I wanted to be around this magical world, this um, this dream creation. Um, I left school at 15 with um, no real uh, education in filmmaking, but with this dream to um, try and find a way of using cameras to tell stories or to 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 make things um, that that were emotionally pleasing to me. And um, I was um, my mother had died when I was eight, and things at home weren't great. Um, I was not getting much encouragement, and that always made me feel like part of my life journey is also to encourage others to go through dark times and to hold on to their creative dreams because. As creators, we're kind of vulnerable. We come up with things that have never existed before, and then we try and put them on a screen, or we try and turn them into a book or a poem. Or, And um, I say, if you shout at ideas, they're like small children, they'll, they'll move away. And so I'm always encouraging people because I believe that I could be encouraging the next person to create something that I could never imagine and uh, it will be something that changes the world or makes the world a better place or increases an understanding of an art form. So part of my my life process as well has been able to make movies as a as a young uh, man and, and ended up in Hollywood. I also try and give back to the to the culture um, and and say, listen, you know, I, I'm I'm not that smart. You know, I've been at, at it a long time, but if I can do it and I can hang in through the doubt and the uncertainty and struggle to get it done, I, I believe other people deserve to be encouraged because they can do it too. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, well, you were feeding into your creativity, whether you knew it or not, uh, from an early age, I, I would say. And at 17, you were uh, photographing the Rolling Stones at one yes. of their shows. And uh, then at 19, you left England for Canada, uh, which is where basically you realized and sold your very first short film, uh, Playground, to CBC TV. <clears throat> and your film career basically started there, meeting your future creative and business partner, John Watson. I wonder what made you two bond? Uh, well, we both, um, were, I, you know, I hate to say we were both English, but I think there's a certain thing about knowing people from your own culture. Yeah. Uh, John, I, I started a hippie commune for filmmakers. Where I rented a big house and 
various people who were in our industry or radio disc jockeys and people moved into it. And John had arrived from Chicago um, and got a job at a place. And they said, he said, you know, the only way I could stay. And somebody had turned him on to us. And he ended up living in a closet for a few weeks. With a, it's like a bed in a cupboard <laughs> until we could find him a place. Um, and he was an editor. And I, I loved shooting and he edited. And so he collaborated with me on that first film that we saw, Playground. And I don't know how it is in Italy, but the government film channel, which is CBC, mm -hmm. tried to help um, their industry by making available small amounts of money to people who are independent like us to go make films about topics, as long as they weren't controversial, um, that they would then pay reasonable amounts of money. So I made my first film, borrowed the cameras, um, had a friend put the film through a lab and didn't have to pay all the full freight, um, had John edit it, had a friend play music to it. And we spent about $100 in th those days, long time ago. And the BBC, the CBC, sorry, bought it for $1,000. And we're looking at this and I'm working at a company, which was a wonderful company, very uh, inventive. And um, But I thought, wow, maybe we could do more movies like this and we could run our own company. And that's how we started with the Canadian government's television channel, giving us a contract to make a multitude of, uh, like I think it was six small films. And, that, and we were editing them in our basement. We were living in the house. We turned the front room into an office. And it was literally, we invented ourselves. Yeah, guerrilla, guerrilla filmmaking at its yeah. finest. Yeah. And, and Ivan Reitman, who went on to do, um, you know, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters and yeah, Meatballs and Stripes and all this. He had an office and his family was very wealthy. They had their own offices a block down the street on the opposite side. So um, it, we were sort of like watching his career um, as he was going up to, to, to the successes that he went on to. Yeah. And your arrival to Hollywood was, was uh, if I'm not mistaken, shepherded in by Canadian film director Norman Jewison, right? Yes. I and was incredibly you, lucky. Yeah. What would you say are the most import, important lessons that you and John Watson uh, learned from him that you still apply to this day? Um, that's a great question. Uh, the, I think it was, first of all, his generosity. Um, we, we'd been running our own company for about 10 years at that point. And one of the things we learned was that um, you had to take responsibility for your own future, that to delegate your um, hopes to other people frequently diluted the ability to achieve them. And that um, what we saw with, with Norman was he was a director producer. So he was in charge of his own movies and he developed them, worked with the studios, had great relationships with the people inside the system, but still was not letting someone else tell him how to run his um, his business or his movies. Um, I think the other thing I learned from him was his generosity. Um, I, was the, I was selected by him to be the first Canadian filmmaker to be introduced to Hollywood and it was sponsored by the Canadian government again. Um, they paid for all my expenses. And I had a, a year um, where I would be uh, given absolute access to everything that Norman was doing. And Norman had made In the Heat of the Night, The Russians Are Coming, Moonstruck. Uh, the movie I was, was um, shadowing him on was called Fist with Fist. Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. And um, here's this man um fiddler on the roof uh, beautiful jesus beautiful. christ superstar yeah. i mean and i'm i'm this guy that's made one short drama that um and, and a lot of non-dramatic films that have been nominated for oscars and things but i'd never made a feature and yet he gave me total access so when he was casting i was in the room um he would look at me and say what do you think um he was i was privy to the private conversations that he and his producing team had, um, the ones about 
how they were strategizing to work with actors that were difficult or how to get problems solved with the studio or so I was and because I'd run my own company with my partner John these aspects of our careers we we realized that if we didn't sell our movies when we made them we usually made them out of our own pocket we would then have to go and work for other people and so we learned how to try and find people that would sponsor us or get t television clearance times and things so a lot of while I was a filmmaker I was also a, a businessman and I was watching that Norman was also a businessman taking responsibility and using allies I mean he still used his agents he still used people inside the system but he stayed responsible for his own future and um that that then showed us that we should do that if we were going to Hollywood. Sure. And, well, he... and I was and Stallone um was becoming successful because when Fist was being made, Rocky had just come out. And yeah. so he was um easy to befriend um because he didn't see me as a Hollywood person. He saw me as sort of an outside filmmaker. And a short filmmaker. So we showed I showed him some of my movies and asked if he would mind if we made a documentary about him and Norman Jewison working together. And then I went and found the money from um a pop, a sources of um I think we got Pepsi or someone to finance it. And that that enabled us to um bring John to come and be with me on the making of Fit. And that enabled him to also get a feel for Hollywood and the systems. And when we first arrived, it seemed overwhelming. We, we were sure that we didn't know the things that Hollywood knew, uh, that we were sort of like the church mouse and you know we were the, 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 the uh, naive ones. But then we realized, no, they're just people. And in fact, in Hollywood, the, the, the system breaks you down into little component units. So the editor doesn't ever really go try and sell the film. Whereas my partner and I, we edited, he would edit, I would shoot. We both had to sell our films. And so we had this more broad experience so that when sure. we came to Hollywood, we were um, looking at it as a business proposition as well as an artistic proposition. And we soon lost a lot of our fear of being second rate or not being good enough because we realized that the people that were doing things were like us and they had their skills, um, but we actually had a longer chain of skills. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't you think that uh, your uh, naivete, if you will, uh, allowed you, uh, in a sense, to go uh, after things uh, more bravely, more, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, um, like uh, sometimes knowing too much can hold you back. I, well, I right. think so. What, what we, we had learned, for instance, in Canada was that we were selling films. And if those films had won awards, they were much easier to sell. Um, and so we learned that the, and we always thought that people gave awards and they sort of searched out your film. We didn't realize that you had to enter films. <laughs> um, and so a lot of what we were trying to do was to figure out how to make it easier for us to get to our goals. And one of the things that we did when we were in Hollywood was we started to look at where were there sources of information that could make it easier for us to make our own movies. And for instance, we took the um, people to lunch who did the audience response testing. Mm -hmm. And we figured there's a place that they know what makes a movie work or doesn't work. And we asked them what, what was the key to success? And they said, something familiar that's new, interesting, and different. In other words, if you go too weird, the audience can't get to it. And if it's too familiar, it's boring. Yeah. And so, and they, but they also said, but our people don't know how to sell it. If it's <laughs> new, they're always good for selling a repetition of something, which is why you see dozens of costume, you know, Avenger movies or something, because yeah. it's easier to sell something yeah. you've already figured out how to market. It's established. And, when I was thinking about writing Robin Hood, I phoned up the um, marketing uh, test guy who had now worked, what was working at Warner Brothers <laughs> and asked him, why did Batman work from a marketing point of view before I started writing or anything? 
And he said, well, we had this tr tremendous difficulty. The TV series was considered to be frivolous and stupid. And yet we were investing, you know, millions in this movie. And we came up with a strategy, which was to disassociate it from its past by calling it the Dark Knight and to make an emphasis that ours was the serious, dramatic, and dark, uh, and, and um, emotionally deep version. Yeah. And that influenced me when I was working on my very first approach to Robin Hood, was I decided to start it in an Arab dungeon and not in the woods of England and not, you know, with guys, um, you know, running around uh, in the greenery, but to, to try and find something very dark and scary that would throw the audience into, or the reader at that point, into a sense that this was not an ordinary film and it had substance and it had fear and it was material fear um, that one yeah. could experience. Um, and and that, that was a key to my um, philosophy on how the film should be. Uh, and there's many other philosophies that we can get into if you if yeah you we'll to. get we'll get up absolutely we'll get to the the robin hood uh, things in, in a few in a few minutes i was uh, curious uh, uh, to know since you started working basically right out of the gate with a huge star like stallone on fist rocky II, uh, victory night ox um i was wondering what was your impact with the hollywood machine like and what did working with a star of that magnitude so early in your career uh, teach you about navigating their needs with your own? Well, the interesting thing was Stallone. Um, <coughs> I felt that Stallone was not being supported enough uh, during the Rocky experience by his uh, representatives. His uh, manager had just died. And so he was experiencing this immense amount of opportunity and there was no one to turn to for help. And um, what what his next movie that he decided to do was to shoot a film called Paradise Alley and to mm -hmm. star in it and direct it. And he wanted us um, as his allies um, to be available to talk with him about the process. And so here we were working with a Stallone movie where Stallone was using our ideas to help him uh, solve some of his problems. I mean, first of all, I gotta say, he's an incredible writer. He has a very organic, smart sense of what works as a writer and uh, a very unstylized writer. Um, he has an instinctual sense of what makes a character work. And these aren't uh, studied and he's not, um, he didn't go to theater school and he, you know, he didn't go to writing college. He didn't, you know, he, he has these things organically in him, which again made it seem possible that we could discover, I could discover these skills in me. Um, and that detoxed that fear of that there's a special way you have to do it. It has to be done the Hollywood way, because what I realized was he did it his way. So we were watching a man who'd written a script the people had tried to buy away from him. Um, he'd written it very organically. He said that he, you know, he was getting desperate. He was in Hollywood. He was getting broke. And he, he, he literally said, I painted the windows of my house black, went inside and just had to do something and wrote Rocky. And um, that, that non-technical, that humanistic uh, sense of personal discovery and creativity was very meaningful because in a way that is the way it works. You know, when you read books about success and and you, you sort of feel like there's formulas to it, you must apply these formulas. And I get very upset when I see um, people selling books that are giving you rules about how to create. Um, and I, I think they're destructive to creative people because creativity is magical. It comes, you get a wisp. You get a, a tiny thought and uh, you have to thread it and you have to um, keep pulling at that thread to try and pull it out of you. And if there's someone with a book saying, well, you have to know when the act breaks right away and you must have your counter structure with your character turn and you got to, you know, and if you're thinking about that kind of stuff, it's impossible to have the freedom to let your own organic subconscious pull the things out of you that you're 
um, your your yearn, yearning, your unconscious is trying to create when you've got a rule book. So yeah. by seeing Stallone work and seeing the organic way that he was working, um, it it freed up a lot of my own experience later on to try and try and figure out how to get that kind of creativity out of myself. And I didn't know I had it. I mean, I'd only written one short drama, 26 minute piece at that point. And um, pretty insecure. I've always figured that most creative people are very um, uncertain about their skills, that I think anxiety and creativity are pretty much the same engine. And, um, you know, that's why encouragement is so important to have other people that believe in you or other people that say, yeah, take the risk, take, invest that time and see what happens. Because it, 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 it opens a doorway in your heart um, that lets you explore things that you wouldn't if other people hadn't encouraged you. And then that, that's the reason Robin Hood exists is because other people encourage me. Um, and, and, you know, I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't had that. Yeah, uh, I can relate to to, to, to your backstory uh, of, the, of the insecurity and the lack of encouragement and all that. Uh, I I certainly can relate to that, I'm, but I'm trying to, and also thanks to you and a lot of other people, to overcome that and uh, try to express my uh, own creativity um whenever i can and uh whichever whichever way i can so thank you again very much uh for uh for having uh for for the possibility of leaning uh on you pen uh, for that inspiration well you know <laughs> it's a gift because there's norman jewison who is in major success taking someone like me and, and putting me in a place where I can learn my own um, opportunities. And he said that I couldn't go back to Canada because there wasn't at that point a business that was capable of using the skills that he saw in me, which, which sort of then meant that um, we had to really sincerely consider moving to Hollywood and leaving behind uh, my sister and my brother who'd immigrated to Canada, my wife's family, um, and taking that risk, but uh, and I always say to Norman and when I see him, I never know whether to thank you or blame you because <laughs> I had to leave uh, a very comfortable world. I had to close down my company um, and end up, you know, letting our staff take it on and run it. But um, that I never, I, if you had asked me if, when I was living in England that I would actually be in Hollywood, I wouldn't have dreamed of it. If you'd asked me that I'd actually had some successes and managed to make a lot of films and a lot of TV series, I would have been blown away. I, I and and it and it's the steps, you know, that you sure. get if you just keep taking risks, but you also have to put people around you as your advisors who want to see you succeed. And yeah. I say, don't hang out with the druggies, don't hang out with the downers, don't hang out with the jealous. Um, say try, and find, try and find people, and I call them story midwives in the writing world, who want to help you push through the pain of giving birth, of creativity, um, and have a sensitivity to help you, and also willing to tell you the truth, but in kind ways. Sure. And sometimes a good note can be amazing. You know, if somebody's trying to help you and they see in your script an idea that you haven't fully realized yet, and they suggest it to you, you go, oh, damn you, you're right. And you can't yeah. wait to go, you know, because it makes what you're trying to achieve better. And yeah. if it's someone that says, oh, that'll never work, that's a stupid idea, you know, those are the people you have to avoid um, until your work is finished. And then when it's finished, it has to stand up to them as well, because then you'll have solved a lot of the problems and it made it, you know, tangible. And we, we watched... When we first came to Hollywood, uh, we we hired writers uh, using the studios to pay them while we what was called development while we were developing, and we read, read their scripts that they were writing and said, "Well, wait a minute, we could do as good as that." So that took away that fear that we didn't have enough strength as creative people, um, and what by watching others do the best that they could do and realizing this is an imprecise art, this isn't like people have a gigantic skill. Everybody works the same way. You struggle, you get something right, you 
figure it out then you do a bit more and then someone reads it and you get that bit fixed and then you know that it's an overview of um imperfection and exploration until you get it right it's like sanding sanding down a sculpture you start off with a block and you keep you know pulling it out until it you step back and look at it and sand down that bit and you know it's it's not like you just go bang and all the pieces fall off and you're a genius you know yeah um I would like now to delve deep into the Rabinot Prince of Thieves universe. What was the genesis? Where did the germ of the idea of tackling this world-renowned tale come from? And why did you feel it was important to tell it again back then? Um, I, you know, one, one reflects backwards and then looks and sees if you understand why something emotional came and causes you to do things. And in looking backwards, um, I see that um, I'd had the privilege of having a son with my wife and we'd been through, um, I was doubtful as whether I'd be a good parent or not because I'd had a really rough time with my stepmother and my father not being uh, nurturing. Um, and we we committed to ha having a child. We had a an emergency cesarean, which was scary because there was um, a lot of... Um, drama involved the anesthesiologist couldn't be found there was uh, they were they were yelling they were going to cut my son out of my wife without any anesthetic in order to save him it's fetal distress wow. and i'm looking at um how much love and energy and hope one invests in in bringing a life into the world and and raising a child and how much um wonder and commitment each child makes to their own lives, uh, to becoming full people. And I'm also seeing at that point Stallone and Schwarzenegger making movies where mowing down people like commando, like bowling pins, and you know, putting your foot on a car corpse as if you were a hero. Um, and I and I was revolted by that. And I thought, what what and I defined it as those people as the takers of life. And I'd remembered other films when I was younger where heroes helped people and didn't kill people as a as a as a method of being a hero. And I and I defined those people as the makers of life. And I thought about Robin Hood as a vehicle to make a story where a proud, arrogant, snobby baron's son ends up learning about life through his peasants and ends up being willing to die for the future of their children. And I thought that's a fascinating story. It's a humanistic story. And um, we've, we've always been people that make movies that are mostly optimistic and fulfilling or have a value in the storytelling. And the other idea that came to me was, and this is the strangest small little um anecdote to it but when we were making our short films we ran all the other short films that were being made and the oscar winning short films and there was a film by a man called saul bass called why man creates and it was a series of episodes about creativity and all the different aspects of imagination and commitment and there was also a little animated sequence about mankind's creativity and it went up through time and it ended up in the 1100s or somewhere around there. And it had that the Arab culture invented the zero. And then the joke was, what's that? Nothing, nothing. But um, I remember it. And I remember that I, I understood the Arabs had been very, uh, very strong in their sciences. They had astronomy. They had fantastic doctors. And that he, the king of um, Germany in the 1100s had a German, had an Arab doctor. And I knew that they had figured out how to do cesareans with horses. And, and I thought, well, what if you took an, a, a Christian and an Arab, a Muslim, and put them side by side so they actually learn from each other? Because at that time, Muslims were always being portrayed as evil terrorists, people you should kill. And... Um, when I first mentioned that idea inside my company, I was told that's a stupid idea. Um, that'll never work. Um, 
but it stayed with me. And um, at that point, I had this vision for doing a Robin Hood, and I and I had a note in my and I I collect idea notes because sometimes you get a for a, a thought that doesn't doesn't yet necessarily have all the other aspects to it. And it's like a snowball; you keep the little piece and keep rolling it and see if more things add on. And Robin Hood started as Robin Hood a la Raiders. It was what if I applied the Raiders idea to Robin Hood, which also revolutionized my thinking about how I would approach it. And um, I, I went and met with a woman who was a professor of um, a, a ancient uh, writing. And um, she talked about what, what was being written at that time, including Beowulf, which she had been an expert on, and talked about the witches and the things in Beowulf. And I thought, well, I'm going to add a witch to my Robin Hood because it's sort of Perfect. appropriate for yeah. that time. And um, then I went out and and in Hollywood, you, you try and get paid to write. So you make an idea up and you frame it and you shape it up and then you take it out and you go into a room and you, what's called pitching. Um, and you hope that the studio will then pay you to write it. Well, I pitched this idea of Robin Hood to three different studios. One was Disney, one was TriStar, and one was Geffen Films, mm -hmm. and all told me pretty much the same thing. That's never going to work. No one wants to see guys with swords. They only want to see guys with guns. You're wasting your time. And why they were wrong? I, 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 you know, I was like, <laughs> oh shit, you know, this isn't going to happen. And then our assistant who worked at our company was reading some of my notes. And he said, you know, that's a fantastic idea. And remember, in America, there wasn't a consciousness of Robin Hood. It wasn't like we grew up with a Robin Hood. But in their world, that was a new and different character who had sort of been, there's a couple of movies made about it years and years ago, but yeah. it wasn't somebody that was familiar like Davy Crockett. Um, yeah. And um, he said, you know, that's really cool. If you want to start writing it, I'll try and encourage and help you. And I started writing because our assistant said why don't you try it not because i had giant conviction um because i'd already been passed everybody was telling me it was a waste of time except something i say sometimes the story tells you you yeah. you've, you've got something in you that your body needs to do and for some reason robin hood was that thing and i and i call those life scripts where your subconscious is is urging you to create something that you don't know what it is yet, but you know you can feel it. And um, I started writing and I shared the pages with my partner, John, as I was writing it. And the other thing that happens as a creative person, what comes to you easily, frequently you don't value. So I'm thinking, oh, this is pretty stupid. I've got this scene where Marion appears and she comes out and she's this large uh, lady and she looks really not very attractive. And he says, oh my, the years have been kind to you. <laughs> think she's, she's not what we thought she was. And then he's jumped by this person in a leather suit that tries to drive him out of the house. And I thought that was really corny. And my partner is saying, no, no, it's really cool. Keep going, keep going. You know. And so that's what I mean about a story midwife. Sometimes you, you need help to, to find your path because you're not certain of what's right or what's good. And um, as I wrote it, um, every day my, I'm getting feedback, I'm talking to, 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 to my, my allies, and they're encouraging me to keep taking risks. And um, so I'd, I'd got the idea of starting with a dark start in, in an Arab dungeon. I had the idea of putting a Muslim and a Christian side by side with a philosophy of wanting um the collaboration to be something that didn't require either of them to give up their religions to do but gain from each other and as i was working through the pages i got to a point where um i started to go i'm going to write that little john's wife is giving birth and she's going to die and this isn't what you normally do in adventure movies this is not the masculine 
um, but I found myself writing this Caesarean birth scene where the knowledge of the Arab world is used to save the peasant's wife's child. And that birth scene um, mimicked our, our son's birth scene. I cried when I was writing it. And I ended up with a sense that my makers of life philosophy, I'd now put the child on the screen that Robin Hood's fighting for that child's future. So it wasn't a theoretical thing anymore. And I found that very moving. And um, so I ended up writing a hundred pages and I don't format my early writing. I, I want to stay very fluid. So I find that if I put it, and I, I use Final Draft, which is a great program. In fact, I consult with the winners of the Final Draft contest every year to encourage them to take risks and things. So I love, I love the system that they've created. But when you format too early in, in creating something, sometimes you're locking yourself into looking at the format instead of how fluid are the ideas and how, how accurately are you getting your feelings out before you worry about formatting. And um, so I ended up with a hundred page story that had lines of dialogue all the way through it. It had all the descriptions and things of the scenes. And then our company was not um, wealthy. We, I, I was hired to write a horror movie and we always shared all our money. So I had to go write a horror movie so that we could all continue um, running our company. So I gave that 100 pages to John, who worked with our assistant and started putting his own characterizations in, formatting the material, um, and ended up um, being able to add uh, uh, you know, what we call asshole proofing, which is making sure that things make sense. Um, we've learned that if you uh, test a movie and the audience gets things confused, that the test scores are very poor, and that that then discourages the studio from investing in it. And so we found that the more the more one makes a movie make sense, the better your success is likely to be. And again, this was all in the face of not having any market. We all felt that we were doing this because it was something we wanted to do, and it was my passion, and my partner was helping me. Um, and we we got to the end, and he. He was three quarters of the way through finishing his version of the script um, when we heard that Fox Studios had a Robin Hood. They were going to make it. And it had John McTiernan, the director of Die Hard, attached to it. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you, sorry to interrupt. I was going to ask you to put uh, some, uh, to put some of those rumors or not to rest because you surely know more than lots it, of people it was out true. there. And, and, you know, it was, <laughs> a, it was a total surprise to us. And um, McTierna was actually represented by our own agency. And so we were able to find out and his, um, it, and, and John said, well, that's it. There was no point in finishing. Hmm. Let's, let's just give up because this is not going to, you know, and I said, no, um, I can't give up. We have to finish it. And many years before, I'd had a story idea that had that same kind of consequential feel, that emotional urgency to create it. And it had a, involved a, um, a detective with a tragedy in his past living in uh, New Mexico and investigating the murder of a Navajo artist. And I was about to start writing. In fact, we'd written, I'd written about a page and a half or two pages when I heard that Thunderheart's getting made with mm -hmm. Robert De Niro starring in it and um, my partners and I, and I allowed myself to be talked out of spending the time writing it. And Thunderheart didn't get made for four years <laughs> and it didn't get made with Robert De Niro. Yeah. And so having gone through that experience and ha having taught myself to give up, um, I hated myself for that. Um, and I, and I, there's a moment when you feel ripe, that the stories want to come out of you and you sort of go past that. And then they sort of like, they wither. And I knew I'd gone past that magic moment when I should have written it. And I was determined not to fail myself, to teach myself to do that again. So I begged and bullied 
John to finish the script. And then he gave it back to me. And um, my memory is that I made one more addition to it, which was decided that I would make the witch or the or, or Mortiana um, the mother of the sheriff. And I would reveal that she had switched the babies at birth. Huh. And I thought that explained the sheriff's craziness and his wildness yeah. and made it made made her character pay off. And that didn't make it into the first movie. It yeah, only he, made it into the recut. The extended cut, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, thought, I thought that was so cool. Um, so then we ended up where we finished the script that we thought was pointless. <laughs> but is it true that there were three different Robin Hood projects being developed at the same time, including yours? Well, here's what we know. Um, we discovered that Fox had one. Yeah. Um, and then we we were getting extraordinary responses to the script that we'd written. Um, out, of, out of all proportion to our expectations, when we shared it with people, they were wild about it. And so um, we started to explore selling it. And I had, uh, again, this is this businessman thing. Um, I knew that we were at risk of trying to sell it. And so we, we had to fight to sell it. And so I phoned up a friend of mine who I'd met who was uh, working at Spielberg's company as a, as a reader. And I got it to her to read. And our um, agency um, had the script. They didn't quite know what to do with it. But I got her to phone my agent and say that she read the script and was going to give it to Steven Spielberg, which was true. Um, sure. And suddenly the agent's phoning me and saying, you know, the script's going to get read by Spielberg. Oh, my God. And <laughs> suddenly he's he's busy trying to sell it because he believes in the script now. Wow. And um, wow. we, 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 um, we had uh, uh, offers of interest from Warner Brothers, um, we had an offer from Morgan Creek, who actually ended up making the film, and we had an offer from Fox. Mm. And there's what this this was very common in Hollywood at that time. It's called a spec script, and studios would bid over over a weekend on trying to buy a script, and they would outbid each other. And so we had gone from nobody wants your script to suddenly you got it, and you know Warner's is offering a large amount of money. And um, so we started trying to find out what was going on. And by tapping our relationships, we found that Warner's was probably going to buy it for a lot more money than we ended up taking for the script, but would give it to Joel Silver, who would mm -hmm. kick us off. It. Yeah. And okay. would probably, you know, wouldn't be the movie that we had envisioned. And then we were also told that Fox wanted it and they were bidding and they were offering a lot of money. But what we feared and what was turned out to be true was Fox wanted to buy it to kill it so oh. they could go forward with their Robin Hood. Oh. And there was one place left which was offering less money, but this was Morgan Creek run by a very eccentric, um, fascinating guy called Jim, um, uh, Jim Robinson. And Jim sort of like an old-fashioned Hollywood mogul. He ran his own studio, put his own money in his movies, and he made what he chose to make. And he liked our script and wanted to do it. And so we ended up that he would keep us on as producers. In fact, he wanted us there. We'd make this, we'd written it. He wanted us to produce it. And, and at that time in our careers, we'd done some other films, none of which had been successful in terms of large budgets or, or getting large grosses. But we um, fixed Rocky II. We'd been consultants on Footloose. We'd um, fixed a movie called Escape to Victory, which yeah. is John Houston's movie. We were film doctors being paid large amounts of money by the studios to fix films that other people had, you know, had troubles with, which also is great for your confidence level. When you've, when you've taken a whole feature film like Rocky II and transformed it so that the movie becomes a giant success and we we got credit for um putting together the most dynamic areas but we'd actually been 
with the movie right the way through the whole film and got to watch Stallone working on it and see his commitment and solve his problems for him. So for us, we wanted to stay in charge of our film. And so we took the deal with Morgan Creek because we were the producers on the movie and we couldn't be removed. That was our deal. All right. So um, the, at, at that point, there was still only one Robin Hood that we knew of. Yeah. And then when our, when our sale became publicized, there was suddenly rumors that there was another Robin Hood um, that was getting made um, by the guy who'd done Glory. And, All right. Um, Edward Sweet. Edward Sweet. Yes, and his partner, who we're friends with now. But um, <laughs> And suddenly there was, we'd heard four Robin Hoods. Wow. <laughs> and so we went from not wanting, no one wanted one to suddenly we're in a race. Everybody wanted one. And then, and then we're hearing that Fox is giving um, Costner um, posters of himself dressed as Robin Hood. They, they invited him over to a meeting and showed him posters mm -hmm. that they made using Photoshop, putting his head on guys with bows and arrows. <laughs> and uh, there was a, um, a, a lady who was an agent who used to represent Kevin when he was at William Morris and he had gone to CAA and she gave him our script. So she couldn't actually profit because she wasn't she wouldn't be commissioned, but as a friend, she gave him our script to read. And wow. ours was the one he wanted to do. So, but he, we didn't have a director. And I didn't think anybody would let me direct it. Plus, I was a little cowardly. It seemed like an overwhelming thing to try and direct a movie at that scale when I hadn't directed anything that large. I'd only direct, co-directed a small uh, adventure film. And Kevin Reynolds was a friend of mine. And we were looking to um, find a director that the studio system would, have, would, have, would salute. But we also needed to get a director we felt who would get Costner on board. And Kevin had worked with Costner on his school film, uh, his high, his uh, USC film, Fandango. Fandango. Yeah. And so they had a relationship with each other. Um, and our agency represented him and represented me and had represented Costner. So, um, and I'd met Costner uh, socially a couple of times before he was a big star. And so we offered Kevin Reynolds the opportunity to direct it. And as John was reminding me the other day, and we were doing a, an interview, Reynolds turned us down because he had another movie that was greenlit at Universal. And he had been working so hard on it, he wanted to get that movie made. And then that movie fell through. And that's how we ended up getting Kevin Reynolds. And um, John says the deal was made and they were put on a plane immediately to England. The, the, the deal was, there was such a horse race by then, it was who can get the movie into production first. And so John was um, hiring costume designers, production designers in England and scouting locations. And he was being told by wow. his, um, his uh, location um, manager that when they were scouting the woods in the New Forest of England, there was another... Robin Hood scouting the same woods just across the park from them. And it was the other guy's Robin Hood. Yeah. And um, so the whole thing then came down to a horse race. And, the, and people don't remember at that point, Dances with Wolves had not come out. Mm -hmm. But what it said about Kevin Costner was, he put his own money into Dances with Wolves. Yeah. And in Hollywood, there was a snickering, a derision, sarcasm, and they called it Kevin's Gate. Kevin's Gate, he was right. Sure he was going to lose every cent. Yeah, like and, like Heaven's Gate with Michael Cimino. Yeah, which before. went straight to the toilet. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, I, we, we were working for United Artists because United Artists released Rocky and um, we we were around when 
the studio got some bad reviews for Heaven's Gate, canceled the premiere, and panicked, and that and made him re-edit the movie. Wow! And, and I that I think that helped to destroy the credibility of the film with the yeah, audience for sure. And and so you know, again, you learn um, how uncertain the studio system is about what makes a hit and what is a success. Sure. Um, you hear that um, 20th Century Fox, which financed Star Wars, was trying to sell it to the day it was released because they wanted to take it as a tax loss because they were sure it would fail. Crazy. And, and, that's, and that's why they gave him the licensing rights to all the toys, which yeah. turned out to be a giant exactly. success. So, you know, there's a, a, a quote um, William Goldman said, nobody knows anything. Yeah. Um... Yeah, that's right. And Kevin always says, uh, "What, uh, what if, what if everybody is wrong?" Right? Yeah, and that's new, interesting, and different. Yeah, exactly. The system doesn't support new, interesting, and different because no, the unimaginative want... don't yeah. know how to quantify it. Yeah, they want to bet on a sure on the, on the sure thing. That's yeah. why the endless sequels, the endless superhero movies, and on and on. Yeah. Um, and that, that that will die, you know, in the same way as the westerns died. Um, you know, there used to be unlimited westerns for a yeah. long time, and this, these these you know guys in suits flying through the air movies will end up becoming much less, and there'll be some other form that will be successful. Yeah, um, sure. And I, it, it, I it, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, go go ahead. ahead. Um, yeah, and, I was. I was wondering if you, uh, regarding Robin Hood, did you always have in mind a very specific look and feel for the movie when you were writing a script? And were there any uh, cinematic antecedents that you were inspired by in terms of style? Well, um, I've got to give credit to our production team and our design team. Um, but yeah, I was, I, first of all, I loved the Errol Flynn Robin Hood. As a kid, that movie was buoyant, effervescent. Um, the daring do of it was fantastic. Errol Flynn seemed to float above the ground as a hero. So I was looking for that kind of experience for an audience where they were so excited by the hero that you know you went away going, yeah. I, I yeah. wanted to make a film that was uplifting, humanistic, uh, but I also wanted to make a film that was an adventure. Um, and so I was, I was really channeling you know, from my earliest childhood um, mm -hmm. adventure movies that made me feel um, in the way that Raiders had felt. Um, I, I wanted an audience pleasing movie. I didn't want an audience testing movie. Um, I'm watching uh, um, right now. I have the, again this wonderful thing that being in the Oscar in, in the Academy, I get to see a lot of movies, and so many of the movies that um, we're asked to view have dark character issues and they're struggling people and you know and I, there's nothing wrong with those films they teach us about mankind and humanity and the life journey but boy do i love something that's uplifting and fun um but still me too has a message <laughs> sure and, and, that, and that's what robin hood for me i was trying to make a film where the value of the of the morgan freeman's character bringing a baby into the world is heart moving and the love story is a committed journey of two people of feisty differences that learn to trust each other. And the, the dignity of the, the peasant people is something that Robin comes to view as opposed to him being uh, thinking he's superior. So th those were the things that I wanted to see in the film. And, um, you know, the, the tone of the film had to have substance. If it was too light, it those values didn't mean anything. Yeah, I I uh, I I've always loved it because I felt the stakes were real. I felt the emotions were real. That's why I've always uh, related to it in a big way. And uh, uh, I don't know if you know this, but it was I don't know if you remember, but it was the very first movie that my parents took me to the cinema to see. I was That's three and a cool. half. I was three wow. and a half. Uh, yeah, uh, there was no here in Italy. Most movies are uh, PGs. 
uh, unless they're horror movies. But uh, and uh, we would I I could say that we wouldn't be here talking to each other if it wasn't for the movie that you wrote and that I went to see when I was was three and a half uh, because that like uh, started my whole uh, fandom and appreciation and support of Kevin's and uh, I wouldn't be even talking English if it wasn't for Robin. Wow. Yeah, what? so it's just. That's the power of cinema. That's the, the power of movies. That's uh, how I they can impact an individual. In a way, they're shamanistic. If they're if they're made with a purpose, they teach something. But you don't want it to be that teaching becomes the um, the key issue. It's that they carry humans on a journey in the adventure, which is the uh, the, the sizzle and the fun of it. Uh, yeah. And that's what uh, Kevin saw in our script. He yeah. he had children. Um, I think he saw, you know, Dances with Wolves is not a dissimilar movie in its ethics. No, I was just um, uh, I was about to say that to you. I was about to mention that that they feel very similar to me. The the uh, the sensitivities, the humanistic uh, uh, outlook on life, the relationships. Uh, one maybe is more action adventure oriented, the other is more contemplative, if you will. Uh, but they're very at their core. I think that there's a common thread there between the two films, and it's not like uh, it's not uh, by accident maybe that he chose uh, your script as his next project after Dances because he saw maybe something in there for sure that spoke to his own emotions and sensitivities and and i think you still see that in his movies like hidden figures sure. i mean it's underdogs supporting you know whether it's uh, black women calculating uh orbits for nasa or whether it's peasants fighting for the future of their children he sure. sees these things and um celebrates them as an artist and um, you know he's a good guy i've seen um i've seen kevin put himself financially invest in other people, other artists' movies because he believed in them. And that 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 speaks monuments to me about who he is as a person. For sure. Uh, as far as you can recall, did you pen the movie with Kevin in mind for the role? Or was it just always your first choice as Robin Hood? Or were you hoping it would be like uh, cast immediately? And do you remember what your very first meeting with him was like? Um, the when when you're writing, one doesn't necessarily have a, a, a star in mind. Um, sometimes you will use models because you're looking to try and find a tone, and that and, and having somebody uh, in mind gives you a sense of who that person's dynamics could be. But no, I I didn't have, um, <coughs> and you know we hadn't hadn't seen Dances with Wolves. We hadn't seen him as a historical figure before. Um, so uh, it wasn't it wasn't that clear to me who should be in it. Um, what it what it was was a film that I wanted the film itself to be coherent and to make sense and for the characters to be true to their moments in the in the structure of the film so that you would invest your heart in them and that that was what I was fighting for at that point in the process, and and, and as I said, my partner John um, also contributed, um, made made some of the great character lines and things in his, in his writing of some of the woodsman's lines and things that uh, you know the film got better at various levels, um, and then um, I don't think I met Costner on on the project until I went to England to do rewrites. Oh, interesting. And part of what um, one does is you, you, you know, you're with an actor. You're trying to make them feel comfortable to take risks. So you're trying to find their instincts and then reinterpret something in the script if it felt um, that it wasn't truthful for his, for the way he was interpreting the character. My goal was to try and rewrite a scene or to evolve a scene so that it became um, something that he could grasp and fully understand and fully invest himself in. And I also was doing rewrites for Kevin Reynolds at at the same time and trying to get his instincts and um, 
that was um, while John, my partner, was coordinating a lot of the actual shooting production, I was behind the scenes running backwards and forwards, um, trying to get on the page the things that I felt uh, from my creativity and their creativity would better the film and make it stronger and make it so that they were investing completely and without censoring themselves. And I remember one particular thing, there's a point at which Robin addresses the woodsman and he's on a, on a, on a fallen over trunk. And, and I said to him, capture, don't lecture. And that was my note. And um, he got it. Sure. And um, so we, we were working together like that. Mm-hmm. And again, um, he he recently said, you know, again, what is one of the best experiences he's had working on a screenplay. Nice. Nice. Um, what do you feel made Kevin Costner the perfect casting choice to embody your version of the Robin Hood character? When maybe I still... A, maybe other um, actors wouldn't have brought to it. You know, it's 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 hard to, you know, because I mean, where would Mel Gibson be when he was young? Maybe, um, you know, but it's such a speculative thing. I, I'm so invested yeah. in the in the Robin Hood that we have, because also um, for some reason, Kevin Reynolds left the movie as soon as he finished his cut. And so John and I took over the film and then we edited the film with another guy called Stuart Baird, who's also really a great film magician. Um, and we did what we had done for Rocky and other films, which is we we streamlined the film, we made it stronger, we we put things um, in in into the movie editing wise to make it more successful. Plus, we were really responding to notes we got from a test screening, um, and so the adaptions we made were with the knowledge that the audience had gotten lost here, or they had gotten too much of the sheriff being corny and silly, and he'd lost his gravity. And that was one of the things we were very concerned about. We wanted the sheriff to be innovative and uh, a, a funny, but also dangerous. Never yeah. wanted to lose the ruthlessness. And um, we, what John had reminded me the other day was that um, Alan Rickman didn't want to do the movie. He was getting typecast as a villain yeah. and felt that it was going to harm his career. And he wanted to play a leading man. He wanted to be, you know, to, to keep taking on roles that made him the number one in the movie. And um, he decided he would um, take on ours if we allowed him some freedom to explore the sheriff in a way that his uniqueness and his, his artistic instincts. And he hired someone to help work with him on some of the lines. And our, our, our rule was, you add any lines you like as long as you say ours too. <laughs> and um, and then when we we're editing it, we tried to find that balance where some of his really funniest lines, then you'd make something dark happen, like he kills his own cousin, so that you know that there's this guy is maybe a little crazy. Um, he may say crazy things, but he's malicious as hell. Because I have a statement which is, no one would remember Goliath would remember David if Goliath was five foot six. So if the sheriff was just a foppy, silly, then Robin Hood's heroism is really not challenged. Yeah. We needed the sheriff to be so difficult and dark and careful about his, his evilness that Robin was really going to be pulled up to his greatest strengths in order to, to kill him. And that that was our, the way we looked at it. And so we 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 we, we um, with with other people's approval in the studio system and our ed, and our financiers, we we reconformed the movie, uh, taking all the great work that Kevin Reynolds had done and all the all the things, and tried to make the best version of the movie we could. All right. What are some of your fondest fondest memories of working with Kevin and collaborating with him in uh, within day in and day out on set? Well, I wasn't there the whole time. Uh, I came in and got the script going and um, got the thing um, so that it would um, really keep Kevin uh, involved in the movie that he saw in his mind when he read our script. And that that was a, a tremendous pleasure. And then I actually went back um, 
to Hollywood for a brief period, and I heard that they were going to have John Cleese come in and play King Richard at the end. And um, that freaked me out uh, yeah. because I felt that if the movie came down to some Monty Python jokes with John Cleese, that the birth scene, that the commitment in love, the people that died, um, you know, his father's death, the, the, the motivations of humanity were playing out to a goofy ending. I was frightened that the movie would never become what it what I originally envisioned it. And I'm not the bravest person in the world, but I found myself phoning the head of CAA, a guy called Mike Ovitz, and begging him to get Sean Connery to star for one day in Robin Hood. Perfect. And they said, um, well, send us the, the, the screenplay that he's going to read. And I quickly rewrote it a little bit, made it even stronger, sent it to them, got a phone call back. Mike Ovid says, yes, Sean Connery will do the movie for a million dollars for one day's work. And I and I said, no, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I told you before, we have, we've already gone over budget. He can't have a credit. Because if you give him a credit, then the whole audience is going to be waiting all the way through the movie to see Sean Connery. Yeah. So, um, but could he do it? Because I really believe this will be a piece of film history if he does it. And they ended up negotiating where a donation was made to a Scottish hospital that Sean supported. And that was how he ended up working on the movie for one day. And by that time, we were, we were, John, John Watson had been shooting this movie now for a hundred days, which was over budget. And they were shooting so late because it was a horse race to get the movie made that they were literally sticking leaves on the trees and dropping leaves from ladders so that they could explain it looking like fall um, for that scene. Wow. Well, that ending scene with the Sean Connery reveal made me wish that there had been a spin off on. Uh... Richard the Lionheart starring Sean it is so powerful. The reveal yeah. when, when he appeared, and man, wow. Um, one he, of the, he's, he's a star, no, no, no doubt about it. He has just absolutely. presence. Yeah. One of the fresh elements amongst many that the script posted was the presence of a co lead black and Muslim character depicted as highly cultured, funny, and heroic. Uh, of course, Morgan Freeman brought that extra class to the role. Uh, what was the inspiration and motivation, but I guess you already answered that, beyond the creation of the Azim character? Well, Azim, as I said, was my <coughs> idea of trying to show a, a Muslim and a Christian side by side. And and as I said, I, I when I'm writing something, I, there's, a, there's a book called The Timelines of History, which, which makes little distillations of all the major male elements in science, in uh, battles in, uh, you know, arts and things. And I will read a couple hundred years on either side of something when I'm writing it. And I'm looking at wanting to do something that somehow satisfies my sense of the gentlemanness, dignity, courage, and to give it all to uh, a Muslim because I wanted to make this world better by showing people collaborating instead of killing each other and um when, when john and i had finished the movie there is a i think it's called the council of muslims here which is a, an organization that tries to present the muslim world with an optimistic and positive point of view they gave us an award um, and said you know this represents billions of people who value that you portrayed us in an honest and decent way and, awesome. and that was That's very great. valuable because you know when you when you look back at your life the things that are meaningful frequently are the things that are not about making money or making yeah. fame but there did you make a difference yeah and um i i also have another film that i was involved in uh, a movie called harriet and um that's a film about a uh, a black slave woman who ends up becoming the key uh, uh, underground railroad helper and a woman who fought against the, the uh, Confederates um, physically with her own military in, world, in, in, the, in the Civil War. And again, it's a story about a, a woman with no education 
um, showing extraordinary courage and and dignity in the face of extreme extreme cruelty. And that movie, I feel, um, and I only I helped initiate the film and the script and help make some issues, make the film easier to get made. Um, but I'm so proud of it because it makes a statement. And, sure. um, you know, so the concept of having a Muslim um, that one would celebrate and cheer for and making sure that his character had its moments, uh, killing Mortiana, for instance. Yeah, that of, was, wow, not, that was but, beautiful. And and that that speech that he gets to tell all the Englishmen, hey, stop fucking around. We're gonna go fight these people. Yeah, you know? I mean that was that was an inspired moment. And um, I always love the line the line he uh, he says to the little girl, and uh, that God painted the man uh, yeah. in various different colors, and that was that always uh, like uh, moved me a lot. And of and, course, and, Morgan Freeman is just. Pitch perfect in the role. He's pitch perfect. And I was able to work with him um, yeah, on my movie, Mal Flanders. Flanders. And I would love to have made a third movie with him. We never quite found one. Um, the other inspiration was Moby <laughs> Dick. Mm. When, I, when I was looking at characters, um, it, it was there's a character called Ke Quicot, and he is oh. a Maori, and he's uh -huh. the source of dignity, and he's the source of spirituality on the ship. And he's tattooed all over. And um, um, a, a lot of my original instinct was to actually have um, the Murabi tattooed because that was where um, I got this idea of a character from an entirely different culture being present with all the other people and him making a difference um, and being more, more um, a, a spiritually rich than them. And so that's that was one of the other um, influences. Um, everybody always talks about Alan Rickman, Alan Rickman's Sheriff of Nottingham, and rightly so. But I do personally feel that your that your own Lady Marion is underappreciated. She's not the typical damsel in distress. She's actually a very fierce woman who doesn't wait around for Robin's love. She's the one who makes up her own mind about him. Was it a conscious choice on your part to have Marion be more than a than a, an abstraction for Robin to conquer? Absolutely. Um, when when one writes a story, there is this fear of making disposable women or women that are just um, trophies. And um, I don't feel like I was able to get Marion feisty enough. Um, and because the script sort of only gave her certain places where she could make her stands. Um, but yes, that, it's very important to me. Um, you know, the inequity of women in our in our entertainment world um, and being used as um, objects for success. You know, you, the, the hero succeeds and gets that woman. That's a that's a denigration of the intelligence and the capacity of women to bring life to the world. And that's um, you know, so uh, yeah, very much my own philosophy, uh, and my my movie Mal Flanders is is a all female movie. It's about a woman who is from the lowest of classes who loses her child to an orphanage by the baby, and um, she gets an opportunity to reconnect with her as a young girl of six or seven, but will not reveal herself until she's exposed all her flaws as a human being and failures and then if that daughter still loves her then she'll reveal herself because i wanted to make a movie where being incorrect making mistakes being um a thief being things are not necessarily condemnations if you're still if you're starving and you steal that doesn't mean you're wrong and um, i wanted to make a woman who is flawed but still totally capable of the of this girl's love so you know women portrayed in success um, in male roles is also something we, we need to see more. Our world is changing. And women have always been behind the scenes much stronger than they've been allowed to be portrayed. And so we, we want to see more of that. Yeah. Uh, well, the movie just got a 4K release. Uh, yes, which I, is exciting. And I suppose uh, maybe you and your partner, John Watson, have maybe 
went back and rewatched it. And I was wondering if you, uh, if, any, if any of you found any elements that you wish you had uh, expanded upon or maybe um, explored even more. Just, this is just a curiosity of mine, certain well, aspects. I, I, can, I, I think, well, the first thing is, John and I are very grateful and a little surprised that our movie is still considered to be the seminal Robin Hood for this generation. Um, it, it's it is. Kind of, it's the best. It's kind of amazing. Um, and I, you know, uh, uh, Errol Flynn's Robin Hood lasted for a long time. The Disney one in the 50s, people don't pay any attention to. There's been two Robin Hoods since our Robin Hood. Um, so we're, we're kind of in awe that this, you know, is coming out in 4K and people are warmly disposed to it. When Robin Hood originally came out in the movie theaters, um, it was reviewed um, often on Kevin Costner's accent. And, you know, Which, my son, by the way, uh, the accent was not an issue at all in countries, in countries like my own where movies get dubbed. Yeah. But so it also. Uh, that was it, a to non issue. You, <laughs> to show you how absurd it is, nobles would have been speaking French in England at that time. There you go. So, so. so and and nobody knows what an English accent from that time would be. But exactly. if, if, if you if you read books from that period, no one would understand anything they were saying because they were yeah. using language and terminology and things. So it, it's it's just a BS situation. Um, For I'm sure. Very, but the the critics they 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 treat films like sport. You yeah. know they have they have to write something so they can seem like they're being smart and so yeah. you know criticizing is easy. My my we we had a premiere in in New Z in New York, and my son who was I guess um, ten or twelve at that time read the reviews and said, "Why do those people hate you, Daddy?" Um, you know it's but here we are all this time later, and it's still standing on its own two legs, which is pretty remarkable. The the other the, the other thing that I love sharing is that when we were shooting the movie, the first scene that um, Kevin Reynolds thought he could save money on and not shoot was the birth scene. And <laughs> he felt that it wasn't necessary for the adventure. And I begged Kevin Costner to help use his influence to protect the scene and get it shot, which he did. That scene would not be in the movie if, if if Kevin hadn't been willing to stand up to make them spend that money to do it. When Kevin Reynolds made his cut of the movie, he didn't include it in the film. And I went to a meeting where um, we had the financier of the film, the people that ran his company. We had John, myself and my partner. And then we had the two top guys for Warner Brothers. And it's always a little scary dealing with the top, top guys because they're so powerful and they're, you know, yeah. you're, if you make a fool of yourself in front of them. And I'm in the room and I'm saying, um, you know, I'd like to say something that, you know, there's something wrong with this room. I remember saying this because I'm, you know, more brave <laughs> than I was usually. So what are you talking about? I said, 50% of humanity isn't represented here. We're all men. And we're making a movie which is supposed to appeal to women and it's supposed to be romantic. Yeah. Could I cut because it hadn't been physically edited at all, could I cut the birth scene and would, would could we look at including it? And everybody thought I was crazy because the movie was already over length and length is an issue that costs the studios money because they can have fewer showings yeah, showing. a day. Yeah. So uh, I, I did my best to cut it and I think it was still taking four and a half minutes. And um, we went and screened this um, birth scene for the studio executives, the honchos, and all the other people. And my, my, I'm sort of feeling like uh, everybody's looking at me. I'm wasting everybody's time. This is stupid. You know, it shouldn't have been shot. And we screen it. And the two guys from Warner Brothers are at the front of the room <clears throat> and looking down um, uh, to the beginning of the aisle. And there they are. And they're chatting away. And I'm going, oh, God, they're going to tell me off for wasting their time. And they turn around and they say, you know, we tested Doc Hollywood an audience last week. There was a bus scene in that, and they loved it. Put it in. And <laughs> at that point, I felt I'd won my movie. Wow. 
and it went wow, in that's a story. because of that. Wow. And, uh, and let's not forget the powerful score by Michael Kamen. Yes. I right. mean, that score is just one of my top three favorite film scores or just pieces of music in general ever. I mean, it's just rousing, romantic, powerful. It's everything you want a movie score of, or a piece of music to be. It, it, it's, uh, every time I, I listen to it, it takes me up and uh, it makes me fly and, and I'm in Sherwood it, it, Forest. It, it, and it I'm was inspired. Hero. It was I mean, magical. It was and magical. It's a piece of composing that um, you, <laughs> you, you get once in a lifetime. Um, you know, sure. whatever it was, this hit his soul and it kind of connected. Um, as we were doing our edit, I then took over and, and ran the mix of the movie, which is an area that I absolutely love. And so I was in charge of how we used the music in the movie and um, worked with really good um, mixers, guys that have won Oscars. And um, one of the things that I did was there was a system that had never been used in film before, which I, I found called Q sound. And hmm. Q sound took two loudspeakers and stereo and created an artificial surround sound so that the audience perceived the, the sound coming right around them. And I put all the music in Q sound so wow. that the score wasn't just coming out of the overheads, but it felt like it was surrounding you. Um, and um, we, M Michael Kamen didn't trust me, so he didn't send me stems, which is normally when you when you mix a movie, you get all the, the the drums and you get the bass and you get things separated so that if someone's piece of dialogue is getting eaten up by the bass sound, you can dip it a little bit. But he just sent me stems. But the stems were so good, we never had to dip it. We never had to fight his music. And... Um, Here's a, here's a secret that will ruin Robin Hood for you, but I maybe, but if you go and listen to the movie, um, I'm so embedded in the film process as being the creation of a trance. I, I believe that our job is to, is to bring you into a dream state and never let you get out of it till the movie finishes. And what, what I firmly believe and do is that I believe that sometimes subconscious cues can keep you in a movie so that you're not aware of the gaps or the moments where it's not filling out story. And so um, I will pre-lap uh, a, a sound into the scene as it's ending so that the next scene is starting so that your unconscious is called into it. Um, I will put um, a, a uh, bird's fluttering in the trees as somebody shouts so that it isn't just a shout but there seems to be an effect which you don't think of consciously but it makes you feel like you're immersed more and the other thing i did with robin hood which i do with all my movies is i kept a microphone so that anytime i felt something was untruthful about the physical activities i would go make the sounds and if you listen to robin hood um, there's a sequence early on where Robin is being chased across the heath and the horses are, are galloping. Mm -hmm. The sounds we had for the horses were not panicky and exciting enough. So I went and made those sounds. Wow. <laughs> and when people were being hit by arrows, sometimes you'd have what was called a loop group, which is a group of actors that are hired to make sounds to the picture. Um, and if those physicalities weren't good enough, I would go make the sound of people dying. And wow. <laughs> if somebody is moving across and picks something up and there's no sound when they pick something up from them, no grunt, I would yeah. go make the grunt because you you don't notice any of this, but, um, but, it, but it, it pulls you into that dream state. You're, you're, sure. If I lift something up, like, I've made you feel me. If sure. I just lift it, I'm, I'm, it's empty. And so yeah. all the way through Robin Hood, my voice. Wow. <laughs> and I haven't told anybody else that. Well, thank it's, you for... Not, it's not that we've hidden it. It's just that, you know, it's not something I, I ever remember to, to share. Um, and, and I 
do it on my own movies all the time if I'm working on a movie because as your as the music comes in as the sound effects come in you'll suddenly realize there's a space that it's empty and then you try and find some way of making it interesting yeah and it doesn't have to be consciously interesting yeah it's just why, why you hear train whistles in the distance or sirens in the distance or in 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 cityscapes that because if it's just the straight buzz of traffic, it isn't interesting. It's it's uh, yeah, it's uh, subliminal stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to talk briefly uh, about your idea for a sequel to Robin Hood: Prince of Thieves. Uh, did you ever pitch it to the powers that be, and why, in your estimation, it never came to fruition? Um, when I was writing my first hundred pages suddenly I got this gestalt, suddenly I got this intuition, and I wrote a complete, like, five, ten, no, I wrote about ten pages, a sequel, because it was just there to be had, and I'd learned, if you don't write it down, it appears. So yeah. I knew what I wanted the sequel to be. When we finished the film, um, I expanded that and gave it to the guys that finance Robin Hood, and they didn't want to go forward with a Robin Hood sequel. And I've never fully understood. Um, John thinks that it may have been Costner that didn't want to do it. I don't know. I never heard that. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it didn't happen. The, the guys that financed Robin Hood paid somebody else to write the sequel using my story, which was not very good in terms of, you, you know, there's just... There's things that and they were they were they weren't British. They didn't have that skill, and they were young writers. They were not very expensive, um, and I I have always felt um, and I I wrote an eighteen page uh, document saying how I would fix their script and make it work, and I think it's one of the biggest disappointments is you have a a hit that was the biggest pretty much the biggest movie of the year and one of the biggest movies the Warner Brothers had had and certainly the biggest movie that Horn Creek ever had. Yeah. And normally there would be a sequel. And my sequel was to take Robin Hood several years later and Azim has gone home and all the guys have gotten spread, split up and Prince John comes to Robin and says, Richard has been kidnapped by a Muslim um, sheik somewhere in the Holy Land is being held to ransom and the only person he will let take the ransom to rescue him is you and so robin is then given this trunk of gold and he has to go get friar tuck and he has to go get <laughs> little john and he has wow. to go collect all the guys together get the band together and and um he then takes off for the holy land and and all these adventures of taking these Englishmen out of their comfort zone and putting them on a ship. None of them been on a ship. They're all throwing up there. And at the same time, there's dignity in, in what they're doing. And they get to the, um, they get to the Holy land or they get to where this, this guy is. And he's a malicious evil, you know, he's kind of like the sheriff of Nottingham, only the, the Muslim version of that, the Arab yeah. version of that. And he wears the faces of the people who is killed as a as a, wow. uh, a warning to everybody, and um, he he what Robin Robin finds is that they they're checking the gold and it's actually lead, and it's been painted wow. with just gold on the outside. And Richard doesn't want his brother back, and he figured yeah. if you got the thieves who have been Robin Hood and his merry men of thieves, known for stealing, he could blame them. And he could wow. get rid of his brother, and that would, they would take the blame for it. And so now they're in the middle of this adventure, and they're all stuck, and none of them know what the heck to do. And they hear that there's a there's a gang of robbers that are um, very successful, and they that's and that they've got a treasury, and so they try and sneak in to steal that money so they can go get Richard rescued, and they're caught, and they're going to get. And they, they're, they, they're just going to get destroyed and then suddenly the leader turns up and it's Azim wow, wow. and he's actually 
the real ruler of that land and he's been deposed while he was away and this, oh, this I, evil person has uh, thrown him out and so he and robin team up to take him down that was my beautiful my beautiful why wasn't it made now i'd and love to know why it wasn't made it's just wow it's just uh i wanna i wanna see that movie now <laughs> it sounds terrific um have you and kevin ever tried to work on projects again i've, I've shared a couple of things with him and he's always broached it um i would love to work with him i i think um you'd be so lucky to have him because you know he had, he, he's star he is a star um, and there are there are people that are great actors and there are people who are stars and great actors and he's both yeah um you know he has this presence that is effortless you know, he doesn't work hard when he's acting. He's very quiet and internal, but his presence is really large. And, and so, yeah, no, I, I had a couple of things, one of which was my Navajo project, which I finally wrote and finished the screenplay. And I would love to have had him play the detective in that uh, oh. because it's a man with a tragedy in his past who, who investigating the murder of a Navajo discovers their beliefs and their value system, and then it changes his life uh, um, so that he can let go of the tragedy and become a whole human. Um, I think he'd be fantastic at it. And I tried various ways of introducing that and getting a movie financed. Um, there's a, there are protocols here that you don't insult people by saying, hey, I want to use you to go raise money. It's not right. One has to have the offer to make a, a, a film or you got to work with the uh, company that that guy works with so i'm i'm very conscious of not trying to take advantage of relationships and, yeah. and um you know it 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 was introduced to his company uh we we explored it a little bit but it never got far enough for it to become reality yeah. um but i would love to work i would love to work with him again and love to work with morgan again yeah. Both, both of them are exceptional people and exceptional American uh, talents. You know, they're, they're people who will go down in history in this time period uh, of Hollywood. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, after Robin, who was such a mega hit, you and John Watson had um, the clout to go on and produce, uh, produce other major projects like uh, Backdraft, for instance. And what was the experience like uh, for you as a producer on Backdraft? Well, Backdraft was being shot almost parallel to Robin Hood. Uh, we developed the project with a young writer who had written Highlander when he was in film school. And um, we'd said to him, what is it, if you were given total freedom, you'd want to write a screenplay about, which is trying to get to that soul part. So when the material is more emotional and more valuable, you, you get better material. And um, he said he'd been a volunteer fireman in his summer vacations in the, an area here called Laguna. And he wanted to write about firemen from having had that experience and having been around them. And um, we developed it at one studio. It didn't get made. We took it to another. And it was belittled as being just a TV adventure. You know, it's huh. like an action film for, for an action series. And But Ron Howard... Um, was looking for a project to work with Tom Cruise on. And he thought maybe that would be um, a, a good piece for him, the lead character. And um, once Robin Hood had sold and he'd read Robin Hood, we were able to persuade Ron that we knew how to develop a script and that our writer, um, who he had taken off the project, put other writers on it, could probably, if he was given freedom to get Ron's notes, would probably be able to create the script to the way that he wanted it. So Ron let us do that. We worked with the writer and um, it changed Ron's perspective. He was going to go work on another movie and then cancel that other movie. He was going to work with some other company and kept Backdraft for himself. And that's how it ended up getting made. But it was being shot at the same time so our third partner, um, Richard Lewis, was on the set of that one. I was sort of gravitating between the two, uh, trying to keep things going in both worlds. And um, we we had 
you know, a great experience working with Ron and I still, um, I still swap emails with him. I was saw him recently at a screening of 13 lives, which I think is an extraordinary yeah. film, yeah. very emotional, yeah. very great use of the film medium. Um, so, um, and again, there's another person I'd love to work with again. Sure. Uh, I love your rendition of the Magnific Magnificent Seven that you and John Watson created, by the way. And um, I think that like a lot of your work, it was ahead of its time in that you took a classic piece of piece of film literature and transposed it and expanded it for television. And everybody's doing that these days. But you guys were doing it in the 90s. So why did you... And, and, and we loved Magnificent Seven. It was a film that um, I broke down every... I, I literally took the film and made notes and broke it down because I thought it was such a perfect film plot. And, and I was there's gonna elements ask you... of, you know, sure. if you ask me, Robin Hood, Magnificent Seven, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, <laughs> uh, uh, Ocean's Eleven, there is a... Um, uh, there's a humanistic underdog against impossible odds uh, by uh, succeeding by bonding together in all those. And um, that, that represents a, a kind of mythic folk tale that keeps getting retold. And we also love the music, man. The Magnificent Seven theme is just so cool. It's, yeah. it's like it's like Cayman's movie for Robin Hood. The music just is great. It's great. It is indeed. And um, I think of uh, your Lady Marian, uh, the one that... Uh, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio played so beautifully. And what comes to mind is another character from literature that you brought to the screen, Maud, Maud Flanders. And I think they're, they are not unlike each other in that they both strive to break into the world and live life on their own terms, though in vastly different circumstances. You, re you reunited with Morgan Freeman and in a way Robin Wright, since she had been poised to play your Marion initially yes she was she was going to play marion and then she got pregnant and couldn't do yeah. it and um, what what prompted you to tackle this classic story as writer and director um well i don't want to be too long-winded about it but um <laughs> I, after i read no robin hood uh, i knew i was going to write a woman's story and i knew it was historical but i didn't know what it was but i also knew it was going to be life-changing for me and i tried finding historical characters. I looked at Molly Malone and Nell Gwynn, who are two famous English period, like 1700s characters, and they didn't move me. And, but I had this, and I literally was a gut instinct. I could literally point to the part of my belly and say, I have a story sitting here and it won't come out. <sighs> and I heard, I heard an orphans and foundlings home was being talked about on public radio, which had become a museum and had, um, letters from women from 150 years ago who had abandoned their children on the doorstep. And I thought, what does a mother write to a child she'll never see again? And suddenly after, after two years of knowing I was gonna write a woman's story, these lines came to me, which was something like, what say you child now that you've heard your mother's story? And I thought it was gonna be that a little girl who's six years old has been read a letter about her mother with all of her mother's flaws, all of her failings and why she let her ch child be abandoned to an orphanage. And the little girl says, you could throw me out without a crust, a crust to eat before I would, I would never deny that woman my love. And then she says, prepare yourself child for I am that woman, I am your mother. And it teared me up. And what I felt I was gonna write was a story about a woman who didn't want to trick her daughter into loving her and who had failed her by having lost her to a, to a foundling home and was now trying to put the world right again and wanted her daughter to know everything that had gone wrong, including who her husband, who her father was. And, and, and the, I think the movie was out, came out of me because I'd had the privilege of having a daughter. And I wanted to write a story about a woman who was floored and who had made mistakes and had stolen. But you understood that this was survival and she was forced into these things and you saw her as being lovable and valuable no matter what. And um, I shared those lines with my assistant, um, who was a woman who had written a, a thesis on Shiro's when she was at Brown. 
and we both teared up. And I decided I would not tell my partners that I was going to start working on a woman's story because of what had happened with the Indian project where I'd been talked out of it. I decided I would do this in secret. And so I started writing and looking at um, all these historical elements that I wanted to use to test this woman and to explore her nature. And um, as I was about five days in and letting my assistant read the, the pages as I was creating them, I was also doing all my normal work. So I would I was going home at night and typing because the story was flowing out of me like a like a gusher of emotions. And it, I couldn't wait to discover what else my body was going to write. And um, my my assistant showed me the front cover of the book, Ball Flanders, which was written in the 1700s. And it says, the memoirs of a thief and a whore who ends up living well in Virginia. And then I got the what's called the cliff notes here, which is the distilled study version of the of the story because I wanted to find out what was inside that story and found that I wanted to borrow the character and show someone who is poor and struggling who ends up going into a into a whorehouse because there's no other place for her to go and then falls in love with an artist who wants to paint mm -hmm. a model and she's the cheapest one. She's the only one he can afford and takes her home and, and paints her and falls in love with her. And that, that was the story I wanted to tell. But by yeah. using some of Mal Flanders um, and that character, I was able to also draw on a lot of historical elements. And um, I wrote that script in five weeks in my spare time while I was doing all my work. It just poured out of me. Wow. And then I said, okay, I'm really scared. Who do I want to direct? Who do I want to direct as an actor? And I decided that I really wanted somebody who was an ally, someone I valued. And so um, John and I, and John sent the script to Morgan Freeman. So before I got a mull, Morgan read, I think your words are poetry. Uh, you can tell people you have Morgan Freeman. And Morgan gave me credibility then to go look for a mall Flanders. Sure. Uh one of the projects that you're developing is called Rogue, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. You're teaming, you're teaming up again with Robin Wright and her production company to bring it to life. Uh, how far along is it? And can you tell me more about it? Um, well, that, that project has sort of got sidelined as Robin's gone on to other things. Mm -hmm. uh, Rogue was a, a, a Robin Hoodish adventure that I wrote. Um, it is the story of a highwayman who um, ends up about to be um, hung and he's given an opportunity to go undercover um, and bring down a gang of thieves who are destroying the, uh, the future of England or he can be hung. And so he says, yes, I'll go and, and uh, try and bring him down. But really he's fallen in love with this young woman who is the daughter of an English lord who went to India and married an Indian woman, and she is half Indian, and he's sticking around to see if he can get laid by her. <laughs> but he, he's really not volunteering to save England. But um, but as he stumbles forward, this woman is forcing him to become more and more of a hero, and so it's and it's steampunk, so that it's sort of full of. Um, uh, sort of like a, a a larger than life perspective so instead of being hung they've invented because it's the age of reason they've invented a machine that's driven by steam that plucks your head off because they think that's <laughs> more humane and it's, wow. <laughs> it's full of those kinds of um uh and and the women are stronger than the men in this piece and um you know it's just uh it's just a, a fun adventure where this guy hates the rich because his father was was hung by a rich man and who lied about it, having lost his watch and then finds it in his pocket, and um, he he suddenly ends up saving England. Oh, wow! Well, I hope uh, we'll see it come to fruition some sometime down in the future. It, and it's, sounds, it's, it sounds great to me. It's very Robin Hoody because it's all about the thieves and the and the and the culture of the underbelly 
all turning around and saving England uh, yeah. when, the, when the rich and the snobby are, are unable to do it. Yeah. Um, I was, I'm going to bring up your photography because you're also an accomplished photographer. And I was wondering what does photography give you that writing and producing don't? Is it the immediate feedback that you get? Um, you know, I tried to do photography the way you're supposed to do it my whole life. Um, you know, there are certain rules, compose on the thirds, have the right focus, have the right exposures. And I gave up, and I love nature photography, but I gave it up um, and just concentrated on my filmmaking until I saw my daughter taking photographs with my cameras and she hadn't been taught anything. And the way she focused or the way she composed were kind of ethereal and different. And I realized that maybe I'd made a mistake trying to copy what I was supposed to do. And so I started experimenting with digital cameras um, and literally shaking the camera as I take an image um, and, and seeing all the striations and all these, or, or I would take a photo of waves, but I'd, I'd use very, very long exposures. So the waves suddenly become shapes and forms that are magical. And so what I've, what I've gone through is 14 years of transition of letting go of all the rules I've been taught to look at what happens if I experiment. And I now say I'm using the camera like a brush and not a gun. And um, literally uh, three weeks ago, I put up my first ever um, photography website. And I've been yeah. selling my photos through a designer friend of mine, six foot, 10 foot, um, mostly to high net worth individuals. But I literally put my first uh, website up and it's pendentiumphotography.com. Right. Um, I checked I'm... it out, by the way. Oh, you did? Yes. I did, of course. <laughs> That's why I wanted what, to ask you about the photography. What did you? What was your uh, uh, impression when you looked at it? Uh, I was. Uh, I was. It was not what what I was expecting. I was. Ex I mean, I was in a positive way. Uh, I was uh, blown away. I mean, uh, your style is unlike uh, anything that uh, I know of photography. I mean, it's just so original. And I like original stuff. I don't like the path that, uh, that's already being like taken. I like when we go down the rabbit holes and that are not explored. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's great. When you told me that it was up, I went and checked it out and uh, went, whoa. Well, and thank you. Um, I'm blown away at what I was. I, I, that's what I, I feel. I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to discover. If you if you take photographs and you don't know what you're going to discover, as opposed to try and capture things, yeah. and then what, what it means spiritually is that I have to look at the image and discover what it's saying to me. And, I, and I've learned that... Um, there is a, another aesthetic that if you if you could call it your voice, but when a move when when I'm I, I will do a little sharpening, I'll do a little contrast. I don't know Photoshop. I don't have it. It overwhelms me. I'm I'm very analog. I use very simple tools. Um, when it feels right, it makes me choke up. And um, I'm, you know, it's the, the the it's therapy because I can be lost for hours in my photography just working with the screen little music in the background there's no studios there's no rewrites there's no budgets it's very pure what do i feel and yeah. um also i i discovered that by making like kaleidoscope images um and letting things sort of like mirror off each other i i, I would find because i can't predict what's going to happen these extraordinary uh dynamic uh, visuals and they they blow my mind yeah. and I call them mandelas organic mandelas because you can meditate on them and look at um, I found uh, trees in Hawaii where I've reflected branches on each other and suddenly there's this romantic um, sensory uh, web that you 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 know you'd never know it existed until until by accident you put these pieces together just just to see what they would feel like so yeah no it's been it's a lovely uh sensory thing and i never thought i would ever get to that kind of 
place where images surprised me and blew me away. So I was well, blown away frequently. And then I go, no, this is shit. This is awful. This no. is just silly. You know, <laughs> if, I know, if, you know. If, uh, if you're blown away, other people are going to be blown away. That's what I feel. And also, uh, just to play on uh, on what you said earlier, uh, in this case, the photos take you and you are not taking the photos, maybe. Yes. Right? Yeah, I they, they come to me and I yeah. have to discover them um, because if I if I apply my normal criticism to the work, I will not I would not work on the images. But I what I what I found is that if you sustain a question, what is in here? What do I what what have I missed? You start to see another layer in the images because some of them are abstract. They're um they're they're not you know, they, they don't have rules. There's reflections uh, that, that dance. And, and so you have to find how does it affect your eye and your emotions because there doesn't have um, visual cues to say, oh, that's a flower. Yeah. Or that's water. It's, it's this is a dance of shapes. And, um, and that may be water, it may be sand, or it may be you know, flowers moving the camera at the same time as you take the picture, or maybe koi that dance through the frame in slow motion and leave a trail of colors. And you know, so you know, it's been it's been extraordinary to see how that was in me that I never knew was there, or, or that capability was in me that I never knew was there. Fantastic. Um, Which is why I come back to passion and tell. Yeah. I'm wanting to encourage other people. And saying, I want to see people who I encourage do things I could never imagine, because in each of us there are things that we without without encouragement we wouldn't get to. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Did and, uh, uh, did I ever share the thing I wrote called the Creative Person Success Manual? Uh, with me? Yeah. I don't think you have. Um, I also I have a, a free book that uh, while I wrote a screenplay book, um, there's also a free book that I wrote about trying to encourage people's creativity. And it's about 60, no, it's about 40 pages. Um, and it started off as a letter to my son. He's a writer. He's writing right now on a Netflix, his fourth Netflix series. And we sort of seem to take turns encouraging each other at times. And he was having a bad day and bemoaning we had the writer's blues i decided i had to write him a letter encouraging him about creativity and started writing that letter and um excuse me um and um the writing wouldn't stop so for four or five days i just kept writing and and it was all about creativity and finding your strengths and going through obstacles and talking about people who've overcome impossible odds to create and um, I persuaded my book publishers to give it away as a as a statement of support for out of the box thinkers. And um, if you go to my book's website, which is writingthealligator.com, you can download a page, I'm sorry, you can download a chapter from my book on creativity, but you can also download by going through the steps, you can download this book for free. And, um, I'm very proud of it because I found that it does inspire people who are like us, explorers. And um, its goal is to just encourage people to take creative risks and not to feel that you have to get it right, right away. The, this, this process of do something that's passionate um, and then see what you can bring out of it and then share it with somebody trustworthy, learn a little bit more and then fix a little more and that 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 way to creativity, I think, is truly the right way. And then and then you start to develop your voice, and that's vital. We have to write to our instincts and not write to what we think we're supposed to write. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you uh, another question, but I guess you kind of already answered. What would you like to say to boys or girls that are uh, dreaming of? Uh, uh, making a life in the creative business. Any suggestions or any tips? Well, yeah, but I'm I'm excited. I mean, one of the first things we did when we started our film company is we took nine children 
and gave them a company to play with and asked them to write a script selling life as if it was a commercial. And then we took the nine commercials for life with kids writing a story about uh, chess pieces, all bickering while they're on the board. And when they're put in the box, they wish they were back on the board. And um, we got a guy selling a tank as if it was a car commercial. You know, this kill, kill people at 500 yards. And, um, and all these different ideas came out because I wanted to show what extraordinary imaginations all human beings have. And this was from 11 to 14 year olds. And this was the very first thing. And we got nominated for an Oscar for that movie for the kids. And wow. so what, what I believe is that the tools that are available to people now who have creative instincts, not everybody does. Some people are more pragmatic. Some people are the people that, you know, the physics majors and that they use their imaginations differently, but they're very down to earth. Others are dreamers and shaman yeah. and, um, what, what I think we have now in our phone, we can make video at no expense that could mm. go on a movie screen in a movie theater. We can yeah. practice ideas and play with ideas. Um, you can access every movie in the world now. I mean, when I was shooting a movie to play with it, an experiment, every time I switched on the camera, it cost me money and I had to process it and had to get it back and had to edit it physically. You know, now you can practice and play and so I believe that the, the language of film and the language of creativity is going to just be dynamic. And I want to live long enough to see things that blow me away. I, I just saw um, um, Athena. I don't know if you're familiar with um, mm, Athena. No, I'm not. It's a movie made by um, I'm going to make Roman, um, the guy that did Z. Costa Gravis' son made this movie All right. set in France and it's about a riot at a housing complex for immigrants and the filmmaking is utterly amazing to me and I am blown away. The first 11 minutes of this movie is one single shot and it starts off in a guy's face, turns into a riot in a police station, turns into people stealing things from the police station and racing back to to the complex and it has um the, the the camera goes in and out of the truck that they're racing on goes to the characters then flies in the air and then ends up at the at the and you go oh, crazy God, <laughs> this is so oh extraordinary and um so it's like 1917 only it's like that on another level and that's what excites me is i want to i want to turn people on to bringing things to us through their imaginations, that these new tools, these new digital and this new access, because, you know, when you've, when you've been able to look at all the other films, you start to see patterns and shapes that are meaningful to you and they inspire you to try your own patterns and shapes. So, no, I, I'm, I'm awestruck about what, what's going to happen in creativity in terms of the digital world and yeah. making yeah. and... Yeah, the endless opportunities. Uh, now the million dollar question: What is next for you, Pen? Um, well, I've got three films I'm I'm toying with. Uh, one is this Native American detective story. One is the story of a child who's um, uh, kidnapped and abandoned alone um, and pushed to shore from. She, he, it's a person who is kidnapped from a scuba boat in the Palau area. Uh, by a legal fisherman, and he's kidnapped because the he doesn't want uh, the 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 head of the fisherman doesn't want to be followed, so he holds him hostage and then tosses him overboard, and he is pushed ashore by a female dolphin and her calf, and grows up with dolphins, wow. and um, I call it a wet Tarzan, um, <laughs> but it's the story of a of a young man who's seventeen on this island who's grown up with nature. And a young girl who's 17 who's forced to come to that island by her oceanographer father, grandfather, and how they meet. And she hates the water. She doesn't like swimming. She's scared of it. And it's how the two of them um, end up learning from each other. And then the illegal fishermen have come to kill the grandfather because he's stopping them from fishing. And oh. so they have to team up to save him. So what I really wanted to create was a movie that is immersive, visionary about the oceans 
but at the same time has a Tarzan like story and it's a it's creating an ecological hero. When you see Aquaman, there's no heroics. There's no, no. one cares about the oceans. And yet there our client our climate change is a far more dangerous and more important thing. And the way the oceans are being raped and pillaged for all the major fish and the apex predators and things, all of that is just like putting a Muslim in Robin Hood to me. Yeah. I'm making, I want to make a movie that you just think of as a great romantic family adventure, but underneath you're learning the preservation of these things and not taking dolphins from their homes and not, you know, putting them into iron or into uh, concrete to pools in hotels and things. Just, you know, so I just want to spend my life doing things that make the world better, but entertain. Well, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure you're going to pull that off. You have already with a lot of you never things know. that you have you, done. You know, that's why passion is the key. It keeps you going. It makes Absolutely. you good. I, my films nag me for not getting them done. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, well, uh, thank you so very much for your time, Pen. Uh, it was a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And uh, just getting to talk to you uh, live, uh, face to face, uh, if you will, uh, it's a real, it's a real thrill. And uh, you have been an awesome interviewee. And uh, I mean, I'm thrilled uh, to be oh, connecting with you, you on a, you on get, a more. You get a, a lot level. of thought, and you know, again, it's not just me. Robin Hood exists because so many people invested in it, and that's a, 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 to me, it's amazing that it's still is is beloved um and you know it it is people like you that celebrate costner and give him status that helps keep something like this alive so and thank you for the questions they're very thoughtful and you know it makes me reflect on who i am and what i do it's, it's you're, most, you're most welcome